Okay. Thank you for everyone that's jumping on. Um, thank you, you know, for everyone that jumped on last time. This is our episode two of our webinar series. This one is BIM's role in specification. We had a great response. Uh, these webinars, as I said last time, targeted at, um, you know, really trying to fill that gap of knowledge for people you know, that are wondering how, what BIM is, how it works with specification, um, those kind of things. But we've done, you know, all sorts of people have jumped on from all over the world as well. So it's really happy to present and, you know, these forward um, to help try and fill some of those knowledge gaps. So the format today will be um, I'm going to introduce, then we're going to have Adam um, present uh, BIM's role in specification. So Adam started his career with our space architects as an architectural technician. He remains a director of BIM store, which which operates under the Spaceworks group of businesses. Adam also serves as a director for Twinview and BIM Technologies, two other BIM-related businesses uh, under Spaceworks. Adam really helped me out in my um, initial months with BIM, you know, understanding BIM objects, you know, blocks, files, whatever you might call them, um, you know, how they're placed in a model, how architects use them. You know, most of my career I've worked in construction related business businesses and Adam helped me get up to speed with BIM. So, you know, I hope I hope he helps, you know, everyone here today do the same. It probably the thing that it really blew me away about um, BIM objects, objects and, and you know the way BIM builds them for manufacturers is the data that's involved and you know every different product has different data you know some products the data doesn't worry too much uh, me as much but other products it's really important you know like engineers use you know backflows and flow rates and whatnot for taps you know when constructing their uh, you know the models of their hydrology systems in buildings you know manufacturers um, glass thickness options and you know I've sat in on some webinars and seen some notable add-ins with Reddit around um, energy transfer through different thicknesses of glass and things like this so you know we've got a lot of manufacturers on here you know whatever your product you know there's different data that goes with it you know you know those things but you know it's about getting it in there getting it in front of architects making it accessible And yeah, it, it really is about having those products and being um, front and center for architects and in a usable format. So I'll hand over to Adam now. And um, so as well, any questions, please put them in the Q&A. We got through uh, most of them. We tried to get through most of them last time. We'll see how we go this time. And anything don't get to we'll try and get back to you at another time so thanks i'll hand over to adam thanks tyrone um yeah so i, I think tyrone uh, did a good good introduction there so i've been with space group now for about 21 years um as tyrone said started out as an architectural technologist uh, on the tools um then kind of progressed up to director and really my role in the business now is r d and the role of the CTO across the group. Um, but I am very focused on BIM specification and how um, BIM is used in the industry. Um, being involved in various working groups in the UK regarding BIM standards, uh, product data templates, um, et cetera. Um, yeah, so I think today what we're gonna cover um, is gonna be talking a bit more in detail about data, how these products are used by architects, engineers, um, yeah, and hopefully give you a bit of insight into how BIM's used. So first of all, just to, sorry, let me see if I can share my screen. That's better. So yeah, so BIM Store is part of Space Group. So for people who don't know what BIM Store is, BIM Store is a content library, a free online content library for architects, engineers, specifiers, when you can download BIM content and specify that in their construction projects. Um, 
part of the group, we do have an architectural business. Uh, we do have BIM Technologies, which is a BIM consultancy. And as um, Tyrone mentioned, we also have TwinView, which is a digital twin platform. Um, and everything we do in the group is trying to kind of BIM stuff from a design space, from a design perspective, BIM Technologies from a construction standardization perspective, and then TwinView in an operational um, facility. So really the data kind of goes around in that circle and completes the full life cycle, life cycle of BIM. So what I'm, what I'm going to cover today is what is BIM. And again, for people who saw last week's webinar with Rob, um, you might recognize a few of these slides, but I'm going to kind of take a step back for any new people on the call. Um, and then I'm going to give you some examples of how BIM is used and kind of um, get into a bit more detail. Um, I'm not going to try to get too technical today. I'm going to try to keep it quite, um, quite high level. But behind everything I'm showing you today, there's a lot of detail, there's a lot of technical literature. So again, if you have any questions or you want to go a bit more deeper, uh, feel free to get in touch. Um, yeah, so that's, that's today's agenda. So if we quickly move on. So I think fundamentally the way we design buildings and the way we construct buildings um, has changed a lot in the last um, 100 years. So if you think about St. Paul's Cathedral um, or a more traditional building, um, quite simple. You had a master build who designed the architecture, designed the structure, designed the engineering. Um, and we didn't really have MEP and services and different systems. Uh, it was kind of very kind of simplified compared to what we have now. Um, not only that, the kind of the buildings themselves are getting more complex, but the design is also starting to evolve and be more complex because of the type of tools we can now use, such as Katia, Revit, um grasshopper um rhino etc so buildings are starting to become more advanced not only from a, um, a system point of view but also from a design point of view and where to design these buildings in 2d would have been very difficult to design these in 3ds now now relatively simple and the the, the the analogy we like to make a bim store is kind of it's a bit like a, a car manufacturer so if you look on the left there, the original Land Rover, and that product has developed over time and got more and more advanced. Um, and relatively speaking, those two cars cost the same today um, as they did back then. So the kind of, you could argue that actually that Range Rover is probably worth more than the car right now, but kind of um, the products got better, the quality's got better, and the technology and the, the products improved over the previous generations. Um, and what I would say is the construction in the industry is moving from this kind of analog world, 2D draft and AutoCAD, um, where you're still drawing lines, arcs and circles on a draw on a, on a computer um, into this more digital world where we're not just looking at kind of doing drawings. We're actually thinking about the data behind the behind the scenes of those those that information. Um, and if you look at kind of a traditional architectural textual practice, products used to be specified using kind of company library. So this is um, this is actually our old library um, where manufacturers will send us these big glossy brochures and material swabs and product data sheets and kind of hoping you get specified on a project. But in a reality, a lot of architects now have Google. <laughs> so if they want to find information on a product, you just Google it, find it, and get the information um a bit like similar to years ago people used to go to libraries to read books or to get books nowadays they just go on amazon um or google so the world's changing and what i would say is the the architectural industry is also changing so where architects maybe used to design in 2d and some manufacturers used to provide a little stencil to kind of trace around like armored shanks for example uh or used to provide 2d cad blocks um, architects and designers are now more often working. Went wrong. Try again in a few seconds. That's because I mentioned Google. Um, so, so yeah, so um, so yeah. What I would say is, architects, engineers, designers are now starting to design in three D. So we now, it's this is the world we're moving into. We're no longer designing in in two D. Um, not only that, if we look at the way products used to be specified, you used to have a two D drawn which used to reference a specification where it would give you more information about the product. So the drawn contained, let's say, generic information, 
with maybe as a tag, a keynote, call out to a specification where it actually had the information. So what this means is you just keep your spec up to date and your drones are kind of a separate thing, a separate entity. The problem with that approach was obviously if you update your um, spec, it didn't necessarily update in the drones and reflect. It was kind of um, a bit of an old school way of doing it. Now, you, I'm not saying we could get rid of specification. We still need those specification documents, even from a legal perspective. But the difference is now those specs can be linked to not only the drones, but the BIM information themselves. So if you change a product in BIM, it updates in your specification. And again, we can link that data through with tools like um, um, NBS specification, et cetera, uh, where they've got plugins for tools such as Revit. Again, our content on BIM store is compatible with that. So if you do use those plugins to write your spec, keeps that keeps that data in sync. But if we go back to a different industry, just to talk about how maybe a car is now designed. So I think everybody knows cars these days are not drawn by somebody on a drone board. They're designed in a computer in a virtual environment. Um, that tool is, tends to be called CATIA, which is the industry standard for automotive design. Um, and what, what Ford would do, or in this case, Volkswagen would do, is design every single nut, bolt, screw, every single wire, every single fitting, of that car digitally inside a computer and what you'll find is it uses real manufacturers data to do that so ford wouldn't put a big cube in the engine bay and say that's a two liter engine we don't know which manufacturer makes that engine but it's a two liter engine what they actually do is put in the actual supply chain products into that again for accuracy and also on that right down to like i say the nut the bolt the screw level um not only is that used to help design, but also a simulation and analysis. So most cars can now be crash tested virtually in a computer where it's cheap, easy to do, um, compared to going destroying 50 cars in real life. So a lot of these things, we now have the computational power to do in a computer. And you'll see very shortly how the same uh, process and same workflow works for BIM in buildings whether you're doing energy analysis, solar radiation analysis, flow pressure pipe report analysis, et cetera. These models in the car industry, 70% um, of the information of a, a car advert you would see would are computer generated. So when you watch an advert for a modern car, there's a good chance the car you're seeing on the screen isn't a real car. It's actually a, a digital model built from the same model as the manufacturing model. And if you look at how that car moves further down the line after it's been designed into the factory, what's really powerful about having digital models over 2D is you can now automate the manufacturing process. So if we start talking about robotics in car, fa in car factories, uh, those robots need 3D data. They need specific information about the torque of the bolts, for example. So that information couldn't be done in 2D but it can when you have data rich uh, models. In this case, it's a car, exactly the same concept for, for BIM. So a good example is, this is Barrett Homes, uh, which is a UK, UK's largest house builder. Um, every house they design is in 3D. So yes, you get a full set of drones because you still need them on site, but those drones are produced from the 3D model. Um, in the UK, and I believe in Australia, there's many software that can is BIM, but probably the most popular is Autodesk Revit. So this is an Autodesk Revit model, and everything you're seeing on here, no one's drawn at any point. Someone's built the 3D model, and all the drawings, the schedules, the information is basically just a snapshot of view, a section cut of that model. Um, and all the data you're seeing on there, like the callouts, they're just tagging information out of that model. And again, if you change something in the 3D, it changes in all your 2Ds, etc. But the important thing to understand from this, from a specification point of view, from a manufacturer's perspective is, this model's built using manufacturer, manufacturer's content. Yes, an architect can design and draw a generic wall, um, but if that architect can download a really nice wall from a manufacturer, which has got all the data in and behaves properly, it's a lot easier to do that than it is to go and design and build their own wall. 
Um, so a lot of manufacturers are now providing these 3D BIM files. Uh, you could call them 3D CAD blocks, but they're really a lot more powerful than that for specifiers to drag and drop into these, these buildings. And again, if you get your products in one of these buildings, then it appears on the drones, it appears in the schedules, it appears in the specification, etc. These same models are now used for 3D visuals. So where you used to go and send that model away to a 3D visualizer, um, pretty much with a press of a button in tools such as Revit, you can generate photorealistic renderings at a press of a button. And that's because these BIM objects contain all the materials, uh, et cetera. So again, if you, this curtain wall manufacturer here, who provides this curtain wall, oh, that the actual transparency of that is defined, the reflectivity of it's defined. Again, if you've got a certain texture on your floor tiles, that's all built into these BIM objects. So when you give these objects to your specifiers, it's not only a 3D model, it also contains the material data, but also all the performance data as well. So then this model moves into construction and the contractor will use it for coordination and clash detection. So BIM isn't just used for the design process that moves down the line and then the contractor uses BIM. So the models are given to the contractor and then it, 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 they use for various purposes, whether that's clash detection, cost estimation, 4D planning and sequencing, etc. And we'll have some examples of that later. But fundamentally, it all starts with these things, which are your products. So these are digital representations of your products. And again, you're not just pretty 3D pictures. Um, you also contain a load of data about your product, whether that's heating capacity, your website information, contact information, heating efficiency, heating outputs, um, all embedded in this single digital object. So if we look on this radiator, for example, We'll see it's got product page URL, product documentation. It's got stuff like the weight in kilograms, the water content, head heated surface area, heated outputs in watts, all built into it. Now this radiator can all, all also be plumbed into the boiler. And what you'll find is this boiler's got its own information. So again, these objects can talk to each other as a system. So when somebody puts this boiler in, this boiler's got a heating output, and, and that architect goes and puts 20 radiators in, they can be plumbed together, and you can see down here, you can connect these into each other and do various reports, again, which you will see, see later today. What's super important about all this is, though, is that this data is built to industry standards. Because the problem is, um, if, if a manufacturer builds a bit of content, let's say this boiler manufacturer builds a content, then a different manufacturer builds a bit of content, you might call this here different things. And then when you're trying to schedule this, you get into all sorts of problems. So there is industry standard data um, and standards to take into consideration when building this content. So there's lots of BIM standards. Uh, probably the most famous one is ISO 19650, which defines the process for BIM on a construction project uh, or an asset. So this suite of documents is really a project level um, spec, um, spec, um, standard. And it defines how people should work in BIM and how BIM should be used on a construction project. But there is some information in these documents about, for example, part four here, talking about how information exchange, how information should be exchanged between different parties or between different stages in the project. And again, about information about the operational phase. So again, how data should be used in these BIM, BIM models, pardon me expression, um, for the operational phase. So when this model moves all the way down the line and ends up in the client's hand at the end of construction, how the data in there could be used for things like facilities management, etc. Um, so these are the main ISO standards which are applicable um, around the world. I'm not going to go too much in, into these, but again, um, if you download them, really thick documents and kind of yeah, really detailed in some areas. 
But then on top of these standards, you have got what I'll call BIM object specific ones. So these are related directly to BIM objects. So if you build a BIM object, there's some other standards here which should be taken taken into consideration. So these are specific to BIM object, but what data should be in there, what level of detail, um, et cetera, should exist inside of these BIM objects. Some little uh, words I've highlighted, that's like data templates, IFC and Corby. These things I'll explain a bit, bit further down the line. And it can be confusing because you've got lots of different standards. You've got Autodesk standards, which Autodesk have put together. You've got companies like MBS who are writing their own BIM standards. You've got the BSI standards. If you're in England, obviously British Standard Institute, you've got ISO standards. And then you've got like uh, EC UK standards. So you've got lots of different people talking about kind of BIM and defining how this content should be built. And there's lots of documents out there. And there's lots of what I'll call buzzwords and a lot of acronyms, which can be very confusing if you're a manufacturer or you're new to BIM. This can be very kind of overwhelming. Also, you've got different software. It's not just Autodesk Revit. You do have Revit, Archicad, Bentley, Tecla, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what's important is that this these objects can be transferred from one bit of software to another. So if an architect is working in Revit, structural engineer is working in Tecla, and then the mechanical engineer might be working in um, uh, Autodesk Fabrication. These models can all be shared and the data can be used in all the different software. So what we've done at BIM Store, just to make life a little bit easier, we've basically brought together all those documents, all those standards, and we did a plain language user guide for manufacturers. So if you're thinking about building content, or you're going to get somebody to build content for you, you read this and this will tell you exactly what data needs to be in your objects, what level of detail you model to, what your model, what your door model, and basically simplifies that whole process into one nice clean document, which we keep up to date. So I'd recommend reading that if you're a manufacturer and you're wondering about where do I start with BIM? What do I model? What don't I model? It's a perfect resource to, to learn that. But fundamentally, this is probably the biggest takeaway is plan your content and understand the end user on their needs. So you've got the specifier, such as the architect, the engineer, but then you've also got other parties, such as the end user. So that might be the building who's going to, sorry, the building, the, the person who is going to operate the building during its life. So they might need information such as life expectancy on a piece of equipment, warranty information, product, uh, I don't know, maintenance information. So you have, don't just think about what an architect would need, think about what everybody would need. And this is one of the one of the lessons I'd say I've learned. So that I've just used the RIBA plan of work here, um, but it doesn't really matter. Um, but this is the RIBA plan of work, talking about how a construction projects um, stages. Um, if you ask an architect what they want in their BIM objects, they're going to say, do you know what? I don't care about all this 50 mechanical properties. I don't care about the flow rate of that radiator. I don't care about the weight of the radiator. I don't care about the the, the, the heat and output in coefficient of that radiator. All I care about is the size, the color, and the finish of that radiator. Um, but the problem is, when an architect specifies that radiator in the BIM model, that model is shared later down the line. And other people might want to do things with it. So for example, the contractor might want to do health and safety and find all assets, which are or all equipment, which are above a certain weight, for example. Or the QS may want to go and quantify all those radiators. Or yeah, the end user of the building might want to understand what is the warranty on that radiator so although the architect doesn't really care about that information it's important to understand that these this, these bim products exist and will exist for all stages of a construction project and there's lots of people involved like i said architects clients you've got mep engineers uh, you've got contractors and then you have facilities managers so you've got all these different people who need different data at different stages. And the BIM objects, which 
specified by one person at the beginning has to meet all the use cases for all these different people. Um, yeah, and what you can do with BIM is quite quite a lot. Um, so you can do stuff like photorealistic rendering, you can do cost analysis, 4D programming, as in 4D construction sequencing, cache detection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so it's important to understand that if you build content, it's got to kind of work for what we call these use case scenarios uh, to make sure that the data in there exists for these different use cases. Because it's not just about producing a set of drones at the end of the day. This model will be used during construction for lots of different purposes uh, and it'll be used in operation as well. Um, it's also worth to understand that there isn't just one BIM project file. Actually, there'll be a structural model, an MEP model, and an architectural model. And your product, depending on the type of product, will be either specified by the structural engineer, the mechanical engineer, or the architect. And they'll be put in one of those um, models. This is just an example. Sometimes you have subcontractors involved here as well. Um, so that's important to understand. But what happens is that model gets federated into a single model, and then the contractor will take that federated model and do things like clash detection uh, and understand where all those problems are, do reports, and basically start to highlight those issues. So this is one good example. So making sure that your BIM content is accurate geometrically is also important. You'll hear a lot of people talk about, well, we'll just use the out-the-box Revit content which is okay in some scenarios, but if you want to get to kind of this level of clash detection, you need the actual manufacturer's um, content. Because what this allows you to do is um, make sure it's fit for purpose. So yeah, you might have a, 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 a riser plant cupboard um, and it might have a big air handling unit in there, but let's say that's in an apartment and it's it needs to be less than a certain amount of decibels um, might not fit anymore because you just put 200 millimeters of padding around it. So it's important that the actual real product information is in there and it's accurate. Some good examples of kind of clash detection in BIM. So kind of pipes going through ducts, etc., etc. Because again, all these systems would be designed independently by different people, different subcontractors. So federating them together allows contractors to de-risk it. So that's why contractors like BIM, it's about de-risking the process because it's cheaper to find these in a computer than it is on site. So very similar to how Ford would design a car in a computer for all those individual bits, then crash it and see if it's going to work. We can do exactly the same virtually for the building. Um, what I would say is, kind of, here's some good examples of kind of maybe where BIM wasn't used. Some of these might be a joke, but you kind of get the idea of kind of, it's a lot cheaper to spot these in a computer before you've built it on real life inside. So again, just a, some examples of how that's used for clash detection. But again, going back, data is key, understanding what data you need. Um, there's different types of data. So you've got your standard data, such as Corby, which is kind of industry standard. You've got standard data from the industry, such as SEN442, which talks about product data templates. You've got your IFC data, which is data which is needed to make your content in interoperable. We'll talk about later. And then you've also got your data, some manufacturer's data, information you want to put across to the specifier. So anything where your product does something unique, maybe it's something to do with sustainability, you can add any data you want above and beyond on top of the industry standard data. And then the other one is software-specific data. So a lot of different BIM software, like Revit does things which other BIM software doesn't do. And other software like Archicad will do things Revit doesn't do. And it needs certain data in there to do that stuff. Uh, so such as um, thermal uh, U-value calculations, you need certain R-values built into the materials in your BIM objects to do that data. Um, so we'll, we'll have a look at that. So. There's a couple of other things as well. So this is a UK British standard, but again, applies around the world, same concept. Um, as well as the industry data, 
Um, think about your typical other data. So, for example, that valve looks cool in 3D, but you might want it to show a certain way on your drawings because at the end of the day, this BIM model is still producing 2D drawings as an output. So we need to make sure whatever objects are created behave correctly in 2D. So this is talking about symbology. If somebody cuts a wall, put your hatch pattern in. If somebody looks at a valve in plan in fine in cost detail, it'll show the correct symbology. Uh, it's not just showing like a big black blob of what the actual valve would look like. So that's super important. Make sure you get the right symbology in there. Then the other one is what we call level of detail. So understanding what you should model, what you wouldn't model, and kind of what level of detail would be modeled. And again, we've got BSA 541 part three in the UK. But again, for example, we've included in our BIM store Bible kind of what that relates to in plain language, if you know what I mean. So what you model, what you don't model is a, is a good example. Kobe. So a lot of people get hung up on Kobe. But Kobe is quite important. So Kobe is stands for Construction Operation Building Information Exchange. And it's a date, it's a subset of data that all BIM content really should have in. Um, bit of history on Kobe it was created by uh, United States Army Corps of Engineers, but in, with NASA involved. Um, and it's now managed by Building Smart. Um, but what it means is, is it's a standard data deliverable. Um, for construction projects. Um, the easiest way to think about it is you've got lots of unstructured data. What Kobe essentially does is structure that data to make it really to understand. So where you might have had a lot of messy data, a lot of unstructured data, it's a standardized placeholder for that data, which makes everything kind of great. Um, so again, if you load in, if you're gonna be taking your BIM project into operations, into facilities management, it's important that the data from one valve manufacturer and another valve manufacturer, because you're probably going to have multiple valve manufacturers in your model, the data is standardized and works in the same way. So that's essentially Kobe. And you'll see on here is the standard Kobe parameters. Um, depending on the product type, there might be one or two more, but stuff like life expectancy, replacement cost, um, wonky information. So it's stuff exactly which would be used during operation. So it's a way to standardize data across different manufacturers, different stuff, and have standardized data, barcode, asset identifier, et cetera. Um, IFC data. So I mentioned earlier that not everybody will be using Revit. Different people be, be using different design tools, and nobody should specify, hey, you must use Revit, you must use Articad. Uh, so it's important that these BIM objects or the BIM project files, which are created from the BIM objects, can be shared across multiple different disciplines. So IFC essentially is a way to do that. So the certain parameters you can build into your BIM content as a manufacturer, which allows that to happen, it's important you build those in. So stuff like IFC export as chair, IFC export type, IFC finishing element. So again, regardless of who built it, what software was built in, when that exports out to the IFC format, the data is standardized and the other software understands that data. Something you don't really need to worry about. If somebody like BIMStore builds your content, we take care of all this. But if you are building your own content, this is quite important to make sure your content can be used by as many people as possible. And then lastly, manufacturer's data. So here we're talking about product data templates. So the information you need on a boiler will be different than the information you need on a brick, different information you need on a curtain wall. So the first point of call here is check with your association. So if you, for example, the Mechanical Association or the Brickwork Association, a lot of these companies, this case, you can see this is SIBSI, have produced product data templates said, hey, any uh, any brick manufacturer, this is the data you should have on in your BIM products. So they've standardized across all bricks, this is the data you should have. And different product associations have created these product data templates, um, which can be used for that purpose. Now, when you populate that data, that turns into a product data sheet, which essentially feeds into the BIM object. 
um, and certain standards if you're really geeky and you want to get into it stuff like send 442 european standard uh, which defines these data templates then lastly before we show some examples here we've also got what's called the data dictionary so this is going to um yeah this is just a, a way to translate data so what i talk about here is if you've got one manufacturer here who calls this uh, in this case this manufacturer is lego this brick's called two by four the reference is part number three two zero zero one and the color is red um then you got this manufacturer duplo this name's block eight node part three or two color all zero two blah 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 what a data dictionary does is basically it's a mapping between the two so regardless of the um the product you have a standardized data dictionary which allows you to transfer information and attributes between the two products so again you want to go and build a lego death star out of duplo you could use the data dictionary to translate all these different products into the duplo blocks equivalent then build your death star super simple explanation so people make this sound a lot more complex than it is but there's data dictionaries out there which allows that to happen um yeah software specific data so this is probably the last um example a lot of these this bim software such as revit can do a lot of clever things so if you're a light manufacturer you can obviously build in your basic information model manufacturer description cost but what you can also build in or what the software needs you can do you can do real photorealistic renderings in revit and it'll even take things like the photometric web file so when you do your rendering the light given off looks photometrically correct but for that to work you need to build in certain data which is revit specific so again if you are building revit content and you are a lighting manufacturer you're a mechanical um you build mechanical content like boilers valves pumps um make sure you fill in this data because it's super super critical because a lot of a lot of this if you look on here in revit you can do structural calculations you can do pressure loss reports would that will only work if you've got this data built into the content to allow these things to happen heating and cooling loads for example which allow you to do this is your pressure drop report but this only works because whoever's built this duct work has built in the properties and the rules to, to, to do that other examples is um, solar calculations so this would only work if you'd built in the proper transparency and reflectivity values into your curtain wall in here for example we talked about geometry it's important that your your um, information is accurate it doesn't mean you have to model every nut bolt and screw necessarily but what it does mean is it's got to be accurate enough for clash detection and and understanding that that's going to fit etc uh, etc et and again it's got to look look like your product from a sales point of view you don't want just a cube you want it to kind of sell sell your product because again architects and engineers will be pressing that render button in revit and it can render so for example in revit you can have a you can have it in basic view course view uh you can have kind of this view which is your normal lod 300 350 type view but if you press render on that that same bim model can produce photo realistic renders and this is actually a stellarad radiator from bim store the same one here just with that render button pressed um so it's super important again that kind of when you're doing building your content don't just build it for an architect to put on his drawings think about actually it might be used for rendering it might be used for these different purposes and build it in a way that supports that and the biggest takeaways uh towards the end now is make your content useful because if you make your content hit the standards and have all the data that's needed that's great but your content's only going to be as good as another manufacturer who's done that so what we recommend is build functionality into the bim content that makes specification of that content easier and i'll show you some examples now but the other one is obviously get your content on bim store because bim store is the amazon for bim so where people yes might come to a manufacturer's website to find this valve um you have to know that manufacturer exists put it on bim store people can search valves butterfly valves filter between different manufacturers different sizes find the one you want downloaded 
exactly as if you were shopping on Amazon. And again, there's hundreds of thousands of users on BIM Store, um, millions of downloads every every year. So get your content on there and kind of hook into that existing specify your database. But again, make your content useful. So don't just build content that meets standards, build in little cool features like this, for example, swing zones on your valves so you can do clash detection to make sure your valves can fit, clearing zones for your boilers to make sure you allow the airflow, for example. Legrand, um, they did rules. So for example, if you try to do an angle which wasn't supported, it would flag up and say, hey, you cannot do that. Well, they could do it, but it's gonna flag up and put this warning box on. But also the Legrand content we built um, also does all your scheduling. It'll automatically do the cut length, so it'll make sure it optimizes. You need a three meter, two meter, and do all your cutting schedules as well. Um, SP coils. So we linked into their online database. So yeah, so people can use their existing specification tool and actually spit out these BIM objects, all powered by our our data backend systems. Uh, cubicle center actually not only give the object the specifies but they use them internally to basically reduce uh, time and efficiency by 30 percent in the factory so what this content did was do all their cutting schedules etc all autonomously where that was all done by hand saving time pilkett and this is a really cool example um so this is an architect can download this from bim store drag it in the model draw a wall and it will automatically design the curtain wall system based off the rules. So it does the height, puts the curves in. It will automatically put these frameworks in. If the wall's above a certain height, these fins will get bigger. And it all just does it automatically. As easy as drawing a line in AutoCAD. Um, and the detail goes right down to this type of level. Um, all, autonomous, all done automatically. The architect doesn't need to think about Actually, do I need a double bracket there? Do I need a 300 millimeter fin, a 200 millimeter fin, depending on your height? It just does it automatically based off as he's just dragging and stretching that wall out. Um, if he does try to do something which doesn't work, the content will flag him and say, hey, um, that part, that, that glazing panel's too big. Are you sure you want to do that? So again, building in this kind of things that makes the architect's life easier is gonna kind of get your content used much more than just building the content that just kind of ticks the boxes for standards. Um, and again, making sure that information can be scheduled properly and actually used on construction information. You wouldn't believe how many BIM manufacturers of doors, for example, model the door in a shut position. And when the architect puts that in plan, it looks like the door shut when, he, when it cuts the floor plan. When it should be open, it should have the swing on, it should have all that stuff on. So it's making sure that actually it works in the construction drawings and scheduling also. So just to summarize before we finish up and take questions, uh, make sure your content ticks all the boxes for industry standard data, whether that's Corby, product data templates, etc. Make sure you include whatever data you want as a manufacturer, especially anything which makes your product unique compared to your competition whether that's maybe the amount of recycled content in there or vice versa, make sure you include that in. Get your product data in shape first by producing the product data sheet for your products. In other words, before you even get into the 3D world, get this data at hand, make sure your data is up to date and then start thinking about building this BIM content. Make sure you're building that software specific data because that's super critical. Um, yeah, if you, you need to make sure that if somebody puts that item in the model that can be used for the purpose so yeah you might design glue lamb beams if you haven't put in the structural properties of that if somebody does try to run a structural calculation on that you're not going to be able to and they're probably going to delete your object out and put in a generic one where you can do those structural calculations um, and again make it functional and easy to use don't don't make it so somebody needs a degree to kind of operate this content you kind of all the cleverness should happen behind the scenes using formula and rules um and the actual options given to the architect should be quite simple what's the size what's the color how many open panels do you want etc and let the let the content do the rest um 
yeah so if you want any more information on kind of building bim content or what makes good bim content or what standards we've talked about today download the bim store bible um and i'll cover answer most of your questions if you have any questions reach out to us and we'll uh we'll get in touch so with that i'll hand back over to um tyrone <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Adam. That was awesome. Okay, so we've we've got a few questions here. One note would be um, you did cover some 19650. That is, we'll also cover that in one of the later episodes of the series. And a couple of people, we had three people uh, message through saying the connection wasn't great. Um, so apologies for that. We'll look into it. It was coming through okay uh, for myself. So we'll jump into some questions. So one is, what Revit add-in do you use or recommend for the photorealistic images? You mentioned an add-in, I think. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, uh, out the box, Revit will has uh, has the three D Max uh, render engine built in, so you can do photorealistic renderings out the box with no plugins in Revit. Um, that said. Uh, you can also export your model out as an FBX in the software like 3D Max, where you can kind of do more advanced renderings in there. Um, then again, there's a lot of third-party plugins like Enscape, where you can do real-time rendering. So instead of waiting an hour while it renders up, it does it pretty much in real time. You get interactive walkthroughs, etc. So what I would say is, um, depends what the use case is. If you've got time and you're not a professional visualizer, that one button press in Revit will get you photographic results. But if you like to tweak things, you might want to export that out of FBX and use something like 3D Max, which is a professional rendering tool. So again, export your model out, all your materials, all your lights in there, and it will render. And then if you want that real time kind of interactive type model, I would probably recommend out of all them out there, something like Enscape. I mean, Enscape's personal preference, Enscape's my favorite. You've got stuff like Lumion, you've got stuff like uh, Autodesk have their own version of it as well. But I think from my point of view, Enscape's probably the best quality wise and easiest to use. Um, yeah, there's multiple plugins and it depends on what you want to do. Yeah, okay, thank you. And there's another one here, I think, asking, so saying we make, split and ducted air conditioning units um, you know we and they're saying i guess we understand how we would achieve the connection between the two units with our ducting but what about with the split systems and the flexible pipe how you know how would they model that so i mean there's a flexible there's a flexible pipe tool inside a rub so um it can do your flexible pipe no problem with regards to split systems, um, I'm not an en MEP engineer, but I do believe since Revit 20, if you're talking about Revit specifically, since Revit 2021, I believe split systems are supported. So you can have systems which are not just, you, you can have like, yeah, split between two, to two different systems, if that's the question. But what you've also got is you do have your flex and duct tool in, in Revit. Which does your more organic kind of curvy pipe and duct and etc. Okay, that's good. And another question is um, looks like it's from a shutter company. So, you know, we supply shutters, uh, we have over 120 different products in various configurations with five different tracks. Yeah. What level of detail do we need to go down to? to achieve specify, you know, specifiable models. Yeah, so what? So, what are the misconceptions about BIM is, if you've got, there's two parts of this question, I think if you've got thousands of SKUs, because it's available in different sizes, different lengths, a lot of people say, well, to model all this as every single SKU as an option is gonna be quite expensive. So it's not necessarily the case, because in BIM, you've got one product, and that product is dynamic, it's what's called parametric. So you can create a um, good example. I'll use a radiator because it's kind of what sticks in my head. You wouldn't model one radiator, 400 high, 900, one radiator high, 400 high, 1200, one radiator high, a meter, 
and, and then having hundreds of different variants what you would do is you'd have that parametric so an, uh, an architect downloaded put in his model and then you get a drop down of all the sizes pick which one he wants that just updates the model using rules so basically i can jump to the next 100 mil size etc so and all the data can change depending on on that so it's what's called parametric content and those are called types yeah that's why it's called a family in revit you've got one product family and that family can contain multiple multiple elements um so that's one thing so that's kind of the first thing is don't think you're gonna have to go and model thousands of different products with regards to level of detail um what i would recommend is with BIM content you would normally model to lod 300 or lod 4 if depending on which 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 lod standard you're going to so lod 400 is basically what would be used for detailed design uh when you get to lod um 400 sorry lod 300 when you get to lod 400 it's getting the fabrication level so it depends who specify and are using your bim content if it's architects if it's um mep consultants you probably want lod 300 but if your product is used for mep fabrication you probably want to do lod 400 but you can build bim content which is bim dynamic so in the bim software you've got coarse medium or fine so a good example was that radiator i showed here that radiator is um that's one object that's if you're in coarse mode that's if you're in fine and then obviously you have the rendered version so you one radiator that might be good enough for like early stage stuff then you might turn at the fine detail when you get into construction information so one one bim object can contain multiple what i would recommend is build the content that works for everyone Yes, you might get an architect that says this is this is good enough for me because I don't do renderings. Um, but some architects might say, Well, I want to do renderings. So what I would say is build this, and you can build this because there's an option to turn it, make it look like this, if that makes sense. Um yeah, so again, that's covered in the BIM store Bible. If you download that document, um that'll talk about level of detail, what you should model, what you shouldn't model, and what appears at those different levels of detail. Okay, thank you. Um, there's some question, couple of questions here about repeatable texture images and how you can achieve those on the objects. Yep. So even though I focus this presentation on what I call like loadable objects, like chairs, radiators, boilers, um, it's important to know you have also got what we call material libraries in BIM software. The material library isn't just an image which is textured; it is that. It's like an image with like brickwork or flooring, but it also contains the physical properties and that is the thermal conductivity, the, the thermal mass, the slip resistance. So these are called materials, um, and you can build them. What I would recommend is if you are building, if your product is a brick, you need to make sure that your um, tiling does tile. So make sure that obviously it repeats and you it doesn't look kind of checker checkerboardy um yeah same as you do if you're giving a texture to a 3d visualizer that's pretty much the same you would need in your objects um and it does take a lot of um a lot of um tweaking if you haven't got that to get that to look good but um yeah something we do day in day out is kind of those repeating textures but it is important to understand it's not just about the texture because that material isn't just a, an image it also behind the scenes has the data as well uh, same as those products do yeah okay great um we've got a question so how would you uh re-recycle internal linings you know would that work in bim and you know would it work for bim specification yeah, so one of the new, um, it's a good question. So one of the new, we const, well, the industry is constantly updating what data should be in these objects. Obviously, it varies country by country, standard by standard. But um, one of the things we are going to start mandating that all content on BIM still have is uh, sustainability data. And that does include um, reuse potential. 
so if it's a radiator steel radiator the reuse potential is 100 percent because that when that building's demolished you can take that radiator out install it in a new building so that's circular economy kind of 100 percent renew uh, you can reuse it and then you've also got percent of recycled content so if you build um plasterboard and you know you've got 30 percent recycled content in there that's a bit of data that would exist inside that BIM content. Um, and again, that could be used by a sustainability consultant to say, go and do a report on this huge building of all the percentage of recyclable content on that building. Um, so yeah, if that data is important. It's never been mandated up to now, but the standards coming into place and we are gonna start mandating that all content on BIM store has that data um good or bad <laughs> if your your products have no recyclable content and its reuse potential is zero that will still be on bin store and what that'll mean is people can search product so i want to i've got these six different plasterboard manufacturers i want to filter by the ones which are the most sustainable and you can pull them out. um so yeah that data is super important uh okay that's excellent it's good. Okay, um, I'll address two more questions. We've only got time for one more. There's a couple, some questions about cost and, you know, cr to create the objects. And, you know, I'll, I'll answer this in saying it, as Adam's been talking about, it really depends on the level of detail. But to give people a guide, you know, you know, we, we generally do packs of content, you know, something simple, say like a tap might be, you know, $400 through to, you know, a high level, um, you know, a, a door or a large window with multiple glazing options, uh, double glazed and single glazed, and, um, you know, might be up to, towards, you know, potentially 2,000, 1,500 to 2,000. Uh, so that could give people a bit of a guide, but, you, you know, if you want some more information, I can let you know. So it's also, it's also point, worth mentioning, Sorry, Tyler, it's also worth mentioning on that comment, though. Don't think if you've got 50 different windows, that's 2,000 pound times 50, because what you'll find is, you could probably create those windows as a family so one parametric object so if you've got windows which are available in different sizes you're not building them 50 times you're building them once parametrically and then that's the height to set in that so that's what i was saying earlier yeah. about that it sounds expensive but you're building one very clever object which is infinitely configurable if that makes sense so every 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 pro, every, every product is different every um every manufacturer is different but yeah think about it's not necessarily i've got 50 i've got 50 skus um that's two thousand times 550 that's not necessarily the case yeah yeah no that's a very good point um one last quick question i think this one's important so someone's asking what is native brevet design and why why is it not cross compatible with cad and i'll pre preface this by saying it you know we come across come across a lot of Revit content that's CAD saved as Revit. Um, this is probably coming from that. So, yeah, can you talk to that quickly? Yeah. So I think uh, Revit. The reason it's not Revit's not compatible with CAD is because on CAD you've literally drawn lines, arcs, and circles. So what you're doing is you're doing what you did on a drawing board years ago, where you're just doing it in a computer, which is more efficient, but it's still drawing lines, arcs, and circles. There's no intelligence behind that where in Revit, it knows that window is a window. It knows that that window cuts a hole in a wall. It knows the, all the data about that window. So it's a it's an object-based approach, which is more more intelligent. Um, what I would say is exactly, so yeah, architects hate CAD. So a lot, a lot of manufacturers will do is create a 3D CAD of the product, load that into a Revit template, and then give those to specifiers. The problem with that is it's not parametric. So again, if you've got one valve which is available in 10 sizes, you've essentially got 10 blocks loaded into that component, which file size is big. And if you've got that repeated, that valve a thousand times on a project, you've just pretty much killed someone's pro, uh, project. So it's CAD inside of a Revit file is kind of frowned upon. Um, to counteract that, what I would say is it's not as bad as it used to be. So computers are getting to the stage now where performance isn't really an issue anymore. Um, 
but it's about to do with that quality and making sure the object looks right. If it's a dumb bit of geometry loaded in a Revit template, Revit doesn't know how that should look in plan, how it should look when it's cut in section, because it's not, it doesn't know what that is, if you know what I mean. Um, also, it can cause corruption. So there's certain scenarios where your CAD file has more, technically in CAD, you can model to the really small level of detail, like micron level, where in Revit, you cannot model anything really less than 0.7 of a millimeter, um, because it's a building scale. It sacrifices performance for scale, scale for performance. So if you load a CAD file, which has got super accurate kind of dot decibel zero 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 micron level into a family, and you load that into a Revit project, again, you can cause corruption and cause someone's project to kind of just die on them. Um, so that's why we're very, very big on quality content, because, again, we come from the industry and we know you, design is a very uh, untrustworthy of manufacturers' BIM content because of that and other reasons. So you've got to make sure that if you are building content, build it properly. Uh, native Revit or native to the software it's going to be used in um, and try not just to use CAD blocks loaded in because that's going to kill people's um, projects. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you. So um, we'll close that. I'm just going to bring something up. This, um, thank you everyone for jumping on and up on the screen here now should be the balance of our site um, on the emails we've been sending out or put your um, prompt in to jump on. But again, thank you so much for jump, jumping on and thank you for quality presentation and um, we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you, bye.